Hey, all right. Hello. Hello. Uh, and uh, this is how we test the microphone, right? Yeah. Let's go. Um, okay, great. Great, great to have everyone here. And we can just uh, jump right in. This last time, you can check that you're in the right place, in the right room. Uh, it's a service mesh con. Uh, we're recording. Let's go. Okay, so um, I recently chat with Danica on the, the Comcast when we talk about her pet project about the, the growing um, uh, house plants. I have a lot of house plants. And uh, I come up with this, I think, interesting uh, idea of how I can uh, explain microservices using house plants. Go for it. I want to so hear it. Everything, when you start in the building, this like microservice, everything starts like nice and tidy. You're putting a lot of attention on it and it's growing. It's the first one um, and uh, it's going well and you're doing, okay, so I think I need to add one more microservice or one more house plant, right? How many times it happened to you? Or like 40 times. Okay, <laughs> like so that. this is where we're going into this one. So we start adding more microservices. Uh, they're still uh, relatively small and tidy and everything is good. Over the time, you want to add more functionality in order to make them uh, more resilient. They're growing. Naturally, they're growing. And over the time, this functionality actually has becomes so powerful that you also losing the track where the thing is going. The place becomes very dark. Um, and uh, like many microservices communicate, some of them communicate well, some of them not. Uh, at some point, you start even noticing some of the microservices are dying and you don't know what is going on there. Or some of them may be, may be too much of infrastructure. Maybe microservices become too big, right? Yeah. That looks bad. And over time, this is how I look every time when I try to explain some of the, or some of the, my customers look when they try to explain their microservice architecture. They look like a Charlie Day from yeah. uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia episode of Pepe's Hill. How many of you have seen uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? I don't know if it's, yeah, it's probably maybe from we'll, America. Maybe we'll cut the jokes for the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so you will have to understand half of a joke from this talk. Hopefully, uh, YouTube will um, appreciate those jokes. Anyway. I would like to introduce my speaker, Danica Fine. She is a senior developer advocate at Confluent. And I am Victor Gamov, <laughs> <laughs> developer advocate at Kong. And today we're going to be talking about uh, all things Kafka. Why uh, we are good people to talk about this? Um, well, I love Kafka. I don't know about you. Yeah, I wrote the book about Kafka, so I think I also a um, good candidate to talk about this stuff, right? Yeah, I think we're I think we're qualified. Yeah, absolutely. Can we do our mic a little bit louder for Danica yes. and I'm, make sure it works? I'm much quieter than Victor, so all right, we're good. I think yeah. we're, I think we're good. All right, yeah. So I'm Danica. Um, I personally, I mean, Victor might look like Charlie when he talks about these things, or may not want to look like Charlie. I kind of embrace it. I really enjoy that aspect of it. But we're talking about microservices here, so let's get a little serious. Um, um, so, yeah, you're probably all here because you understand that using microservices or, or architecting your system in that way makes sense as opposed to a monolithic sort of architecture, right? Um, it makes sense to break down your application into a smaller, uh, smaller pieces that are more manageable, right? You're more flexible. You're, you're giving the, the individual teams and business units uh, control over the applications that they're building and, and only the stuff that they care about, only the data that they really care about. But by breaking it up into smaller pieces, then you kind of face a, the inevitable problem of how do we actually have these uh, these services communicate with one another, right? I have a few ideas, and there's a plenty of uh, the protocols that we can apply uh, here. Okay, well, we'll get to it, yeah. all right? So you're probably thinking, you know, when you start thinking about integrating microservices, you're, you're going to encounter this problem, right? You, you probably get frustrated. And there's not really a good way to, to integrate them, right? But in reality, you know, there are a lot of options for you, um, but there's just a lot of bad ones, okay? So, you know, there, there are a ton of options available to you. Some are better than others. Some are more intuitive than others. So let's jump into those. So first of all, file system. How many of you ever integrated to services through like a pushing the file in the common space and the FTP and the CP file? It's good. It's good. Oh no! Okay, it's we're okay. all gonna have it's to okay. talk later. We've been there. <laughs> yeah, we've been there. It's it's called enterprise software. This is how we were building this for years. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing. About that. databases. 
How many of you build a system that communicate or pushing information through databases? It's okay. It's a good place to, to share about this. It's uh, no shame in this room, so we can talk about this, right? I, again, yeah, we can, we can talk. We can that. talk later a little. Yeah, bit. more but people, you know, more people, still more people than. Yeah, I mean, databases make sense, right? I mean, if you're moving from a monolithic sort of architecture to microservices, I mean, in a monolith, you definitely had at least one database, probably more like twelve hanging around, right? So when you're breaking down that monolith and you're looking to integrate your microservices, you probably still have a database sitting around and you definitely have at least one engineer who knows how to use that database so why not use the database to communicate and the reason why not use database database is great for storing the state for individual service but for integrating and when the services start commingle to each other you very quickly end up in a situation where you need to have a committee of approvals yeah. changes in database you are changing the schemas you need to notify others that you changing the schema of this database and very quickly it's not it's not microservice anymore you it's end mess. up in this uh, like a monolithical service, monolithical mess. In reality, you're back where you started, right? You're, you're back with a database that sprawls and you have all your business units using the same thing. So maybe we shouldn't use a database. What about RPC? I mean, uh, it can be REST. It can be any type of remote procedure call. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you ever heard about the uh, RMI. RMI, anyone? Building microservices, communicate through RMI. It's cool, right? Yeah. Or gRPC. How the, these kids call in these days, right? So basically, they remain in their mind. It makes sense, right? This is how we communicate. Yeah. You know, request, response. It's good. It'd be like, you know, I guess kind of back in the day, you know, I'd pick up the phone and call you, right? Yeah. But like, what were you going to do if I'm not available to, 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 to answer the phone call. Honestly, I'm persistent. I'm going to call you 10 more times. Yeah. So. How many of you actually build a service <laughs> in case of failure? You just continue to, to hit this refresh button and hope that it will recover. I would rather leave you a voicemail and uh, put some information that required for you to get answer and uh, you will reply whenever you're ready. Yeah, that seems, voicemail seems a little antiquated, but we'll get to that, I think. So if we're using remote calls, right? Um, we're going to end up with, with something like this. Okay, we, so we have our microservices, right? But now, instead of, you know, in the monolithic case, we just had everything packaged neatly in one application, right? It was good. It was cozy, you know? But now, we're kind of, we're making these network calls. We're reaching out into the ether, hoping that, you know, someone else will respond. And if they don't, you know, we're leaving 25 voicemails trying to figure it out. So now we have all these requests in flight, and it's... It's kind of a mess. Now it's, it's, it's tangled again, right? It's tightly coupled. Um, it's hard to keep track of all these things, right? Another problem here would be um, like cascading failures. Yeah. If one of the service will fail and you continue to like hammering another service, uh, nothing good will happen. So question to you, uh, my dear friends, developers, how you would investigate the problem in the system if there's some of the failures? What's your typical things to do? Who said logs? Oh my God, you got to You'll read it right it away. You'll get it short. Uh, right. <laughs> well, I don't have any. All right, so <laughs> we're looking yeah, into logs. And you know, it, this, this makes sense. We're all developers here. Uh, we know how to debug applications, you, you know, tracing and logs. This makes sense. It's a good way to see into systems. But what if, okay, and hear me out, what if we just let our microservices communicate using a log? What if we used, and this is no secret, what if we used Kafka? Okay, we're, we're not here to argue that Kafka could be a good choice for this. Uh, we both love Kafka, obviously. So when you're using Kafka to sit as that communication layer between your microservices, you're gonna get something like this. And it's more loosely coupled, right? This is good. Now all the microservices are sending information to Kafka and can communicate through that. And for those of you, how many, how many of you are familiar with Kafka? Oh God, Yay! Okay, good. Exactly. Okay, for the few people it's that a, did it's not a raise great their hands, to be right. This Everyone is great. Knows this. Okay. Yeah. I, so great. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kafka, it is a distributed event streaming system. And that's a very concise but, you know, heavy uh, definition to unpack. So very quickly, uh, it's a streaming system, right? So real time, uh, we're going to be communicating information uh, quickly and efficiently across the system. And it's an event streaming system, okay? So for those of you who aren't familiar with events, they are immutable, okay? We're communicating immutable facts across our system quickly and efficiently and that is the perfect way to communicate between microservices similarly similarly how we uh, talk about the voicemail when you yeah. left the voicemail you cannot change it so similarly how you have a conversation with your significant other and you said something that you're not supposed to say 
This only thing how we can do this is you send another event and hopefully the receiving system will process it in order to change the state, right? Yeah. So this is how you can, you know, the explain immutability to, to, to other people. So essentially it's something you cannot change. Now, yeah. communication in our systems will become more untangled and uh, using the Kafka as a log for capturing all the facts around the system, we can do multiple interesting things about this. Mm -hmm. For example, this voicemail that you left me might not only be received by me, someone else can also listen to this event and mm -hmm. also make some of, the, some of the actions on this one. Same thing with Kafka. Some of the message will be consumed by multiple consumers and they may have different reaction on those consumers. So um, in this case, we're building a synchronous communication for uh, for this. By the way, this is the uh, one of the patterns that you can find in this website called developer.confluent.io, how you can build uh, event-driven systems and how you apply Kafka for the things. Um, and if you have an urge to tweet about the slides, uh, the, our Twitter tags are conveniently uh, placed in the in the bottom. So please, uh, you know, don't do not uh, hesitate. So we already started talking about Kafka, but like let's talk about some of the uh, technicalities here, right? So the how uh, I like to explain uh, the Kafka as a communication layer, it's a data aware system. So you're allowed to build a communication that's data aware. You're sharing facts about the systems that other systems will, will understand. You're sharing the order details and some other systems based on some of the schemas and some of the information that available for, for the message can understand. So communication becomes not only like on the packet level, but also communication becomes on the data level. And uh, if you're interested in a particular piece of uh, data, you will be able to uh, receive it. So um, let's talk about uh, Kafka as a system that you're trying to deploy. How many of you are running Kafka on Kubernetes these days? Okay, not many people. Uh, how many of you are running Kafka on Kubernetes in production? Nice. Uh, pretty much the same people. People running the Kafka in production. Do you enjoy this? <laughs> yes, I, I, I knew this. And that's why uh, there are some uh, automation exists that allows you to, um, to, to run this successfully. There is an open source operator from, uh, from StreamZ, which is also a CNCF project. There's some uh, proprietary operators from uh, Confluent and some, some others. But um, idea is to bring some of the system that was designed pre-cloud native times uh, into the cloud native world so requires some of the skills. And those skills usually tied into into human uh, SREs who knows how to run um, a system like Kafka, but also know how to run stateful systems in Kubernetes. And uh, there's like in this in this slide, uh, it's like a very um, simple explain of architecture of Kafka. So what I like to say in this particular case, we're running one distributed system, which is Kafka. Uh, that runs uh, depends on another distributed systems, which is Zookeeper, on top of another distributed systems uh, system, which is uh, Kubernetes. So, you know, many things can go wrong, right? Yeah, pretty meta. And uh, things around the Zookeeper and Kafka, um, it's, it's good that many people are familiar with the concept, so I don't need to go very deep on this one, but like if people in YouTube watching us, um, they, uh, in order to Kafka cluster to work, it will depend on the cluster of Zookeeper, and Zookeeper requires to establish the quorum in order your data, the metadata that will be stored in Zookeeper will be available for Kafka broker to serve. Same thing for Kafka. It's also, they need to fo form a quorum. In order to form a quorum, they need to have a, what we call the stateful network identity. So each broker, each um, uh, member of the cluster will need to have a like, particular name. So pods with your deployment with some random name will not will not will not fly here we need to use something else so we will be using things like stateful sets that provides us stateful network identity another thing that we need to deal with is the uh, stateful disk identity and the something that uh, when the your pod will come up you need to attach the same disk because kafka is a stateful system kafka is about storing your data data is distributed and partitioned mm -hmm. so um, the good thing that uh, good people in the kafka community work with very uh, tirelessly to uh, simplify this and make Kafka more uh, cloud native. And the things with the Keep 500 
Keep is the way how <laughs> Kafka community communicates. Keeps uh, Kafka improving proposal. It's the some of the some of the thing that you can Google and you can find full description how this works. But essentially now we don't need Zookeeper and we're going to be uh, running this our Kafka in Zookeeperless mode, yeah. right? Major win. Yeah. So. Um, what else? Uh, what else is important? So, what else you want to know in order to uh, run Kafka? Yeah. So, like as a client, as a producer and consumer, I need to be aware of the nodes in the cluster, right? So, how does how does your solution, you know, work with that? Handle that? So, with the uh, with the Kafka, when we need to communicate this, your application, producer, consumer, uh, or Kafka streams application, they need to know at least one uh, URL, which is Bootstrap server. Um, and in order to connect and learn some metadata about the cluster. Remember I mentioned uh, that Kafka distributes data. Mm -hmm. So all this uh, data that's spread across Kafka broker, uh, we use this, the, the um, mechanism that very, very briefly can be described as a consistent hashing mechanism. So based on the key of the data, um, our producer or consumer will decide where to read or where to consume or where to produce from where to consume, where to produce data. And uh, Bootstrap server will give us information about overall brokers. I don't need to put all the brokers into this Bootstrap server, just only one. But this only one broker needs to provide me with information about other brokers. OK, cool. I can deal with that. That sounds yeah. good. All right. What about security? That's probably going to come up, right? Because in a monolith, um, we it's, it's built in a very specific way that it's super secure on the outside, right? And then once information is past that, once we've proven that it's um, not malicious, they can do whatever they want, right? At the microservice level, uh, we're still probably within the same network. So should we just trust <laughs> that it's OK, right? Because we're in the same network. Probably not. Um, zero trust is maybe a little better. So we should take that sort of mechanism that we're using at the monolith level and maybe shrink it down to the microservice level. You know, trust nothing until it's validated and comes in then. But what do the, do the individual? So we're breaking up these microservices and now teams own the different business units and applications specific to them. Are they responsible for writing all that boilerplate code to make sure that the security happens as it should? Yeah, I think uh, it's also another point to, to, to bring up that uh, when the Kafka was designed, there was no, uh, again, cloud native uh, approach to solving the problem. So the system needs to come with better included. So Kafka naturally has all things uh, for you to build a, um, a secure con connection. There's ACLs, there's a different way how you can securely connect. However, however, this thing actually comes with a price. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Do you are uh, familiar with the concept of zero copy? I've heard of that. Yeah. And, you know, so Kafka is pretty efficient, right? In the way that, you know, it moves the data directly from the socket to the disk. All right. When as soon as you add a lot of encryption in there, little latency adds up, right? Yeah. Latency yeah. ends up like all uh, the, the reason why people hate Java because they heard about Java garbage collector and Java, usually people think that garbage collector is bad. Um, you don't want to something that, um, you know, you will rely on some SLAs and something will be standing in front of your system and like around this. Even though over the years, uh, the, the encryption and uh, the, the mechanism of encrypting the stuff in Kafka and Java become like more and more uh, convenient, but it's some of the things you cannot change. So when the data arrive over the socket in the encrypted socket, it needs to be decrypted and only after it will be flushed into the file. Um, whereas we're using plain text, this uh, data from socket will be flushed into the file immediately. So um, this is something we can work on. This yeah. is something that we actually can can solve with the uh, with the solution that I will propose in a few seconds. All right, come on. Up. All right, and uh, it's I think it's a time, right? Uh, like we've been uh, 15 minutes in presentation, and we never said word service mesh on the service mesh con. Hey, you just so, did. All right, yeah. we're good. We're good. <laughs> we're we're good, service right? mesh so it's still, yeah. still still time, still time to talk about the service <laughs> mesh. So uh, the interesting enough, uh, service mesh provides the very um, there, at least like a service mesh, this like current generation provides the very nice ways how developers need to think about infrastructure, specifically focusing on the value and focusing on the business logic rather than focusing on infrastructure. Like many developers knew that how to write, a, I don't know, code for their particular language, their particular framework that will does like encryption and all this type of jazz, right? Yeah. But what if you don't need to? What if the infrastructure will give you, um, like you said, like zero trust uh, promises already and will handle all this automation. 
Kafka uh, SREs have a years of experience of building this type of solution, but these uh, solutions need to be properly automated. It needs to be um, like like one of the characters from of the movie that I really like, Dark Knight, once said, when you're doing something good, never do it for free. So that's why the Kafka SREs would be expensive or the tools that do automation for you would be expensive, right? Um, like tweet at me if you get the reference who say that. <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about like very small use case, very small use case that explains how the things works and the small, it's not because like I cannot do bigger, uh, the, the small just to explain the lots of things going on here. So we have our producer, that will be, I don't know, some system that will be capturing orders from the web and after that published into, uh, into Kafka. Another, we have a, a consumer that also need to read this and the, those two things need to figure out how to find a Kafka brokers. And uh, a Kafka will be connected to, uh, to some service. We can have uh, things like Kafka Connect into Mix, but like once we figure out this like a smaller use case, um, this is where we're gonna be this is where we're going to switch in places and I will be showing some of the stuff. Um, and you need to feel uh, this uh, the awkward silence for a few seconds because I will be switching to different display mode. I will feel the awkward silence. Not everyone hates Java, right? Here? We're all good? Okay. I'm just checking. Uh, it was not that uh, long and it's not that awkward. Okay, so um, again, idea of bringing this thing together will be uh, tied into a couple things. So I'm running this uh, small Kafka cluster with the three nodes and uh, one of these nodes will uh, will take the responsibility of a leader um, and uh, because we're not running the zookeeper, so it's nice, nice and cool. We have some uh, consumer and producer. So how this uh, happened to be? And this is where we're going to look into uh, Kafka configuration. Um, so uh, we de I deploy this uh, with, uh, with simple stateful set. Um, there's nothing really specific here. So you can use any, uh, you can use custom image, you can use image that um, uh, comes from the vendor, some open source images, really doesn't matter. So to show you, there's no uh, like other magic. So uh, the stateful set that will be uh, responsible here is that um, we'll have this nasty um, a script that built in YAML. I personally hate this. That's why I more like uh, operators approach, but um, in order to explain the bits, I need to go like, you know, dirty. So a um, couple of things that uh, I need to build here. And this is the uh, probably the most important thing that uh, everyone will be care about. So in order to connect uh, uh, clients to Kafka broker, we need to provide so-called advertised listeners. This is something that Bootstrap server will need to uh, uh, provide to clients um, in order these clients to connect. So essentially think about this, it's kind of like a, it's a virtual, uh, it needs to be some virtual IP, it can be virtual IP, mm -hmm. it can be like external network if you're exposing this to outside world through the load balance, or it's going to be a load balancer URL. In this particular case, we have this like a cryptic, um, crypt, a cryptic uh, conventional URL. One of the things that we will be relying here is the service discovery that comes from uh, from service mesh. We're going to be deploying this into service mesh uh, with Kuma, and uh, this part will be provided. The dot mesh uh, discovery will be provided for Kuma. But there's a couple of things. This is basically conventional, so it's nothing to do with the Kuma here. In this case, we want this uh, um, we want this cluster to be exposed and available through this particular URL. And uh, the way how we will doing this with, uh, with the Kuma is uh, with the thing called virtual outbound. We have a two virtual outbounds. First one uh, will be with, um, with the bootstrap. And uh, this is very like a similar, uh, a very simple thing. So we want to have access to our cluster through simple URL cluster.kafka.mesh, something like that. And this is the virtual outbound will provide us. It's essentially um, uh, will create the, the, the service that will create a addressable thing. And I can customize uh, this uh, name on the virtual inbound and I not need to touch my Kafka deployment. 
For um, second thing, in order to, like once the initial communication happened, like Bootstrap server already um, uh, provided this uh, the connection, uh, other services need to be available. So advertised listener, this is something that this Bootstrap server returns the metadata to Kafka client and um, um, information uh, to, the, the, to, to those uh, Kafka brokers would look like a cluster 1-0, cluster 1-1, cluster 1-2. That's going to be kind of like a name of the broker. And uh, this information also needs to be available to, to outside of these, um, uh, inside, this, inside this mesh. So for each um, member in this, uh, in this list, we're going to return a particular particular URL. So for our client, for our application, one only thing what we need to do is here is provide this one. Our bootstrap server will return through the, um, through the virtual bound, will return correct addresses for our system. And we will have a connection here. Um, with, the, um, with, this, uh, with this UI that comes with, uh, with Kuma, uh, I will be able to see that right now I do have uh, some uh, data planes that deployed in, in, my, um, in my cluster, some of the things that related to Kafka broker. So this is broker one, uh, one which is zero, one and two. Zero, one, and two. Um, sec uh, and we have a few few applications, consumer and producer. So consumer producer runs inside the mesh. They can use benefit of um, uh, discovery of those nodes. Now, the next thing that we also a little bit touch this a little bit about um, um, what else the service mesh can give us. Immediately, yeah. it will give us a, a ability to um, uh, get to the logs, um, and uh, this is where uh, simply by creating a the traffic uh, logs policy that enables me to capture information from all um, from all data planes I will be able to see for example let me do this a little bit bigger so I can go inside my log for consumer and see what is going on in uh, in the consumer so right now my consumer just uh, reads the data from um, uh, reads the data from uh, the um, the topic and just spits out this result back to uh, back to topic so we can see all this kind of information and all this done just by simply enabling things. I don't need to put um, any special things on my brokers since the brokers already running inside the match. I will have these things out of the box. So um, this is where we're gonna switch to. Do we have a, like a final slide? Yes, we do have a final slide. <laughs> um, so that was pretty impressive, right? Like those, yeah. those difficult things that we, we brought up around the discoverability and observability and, and being able to capture logs properly. These are all very hard things when you're building out a service mesh, but... But we didn't touch like many things that happened here. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, we, didn't, uh, we, we didn't touch some of the things that uh, really uh, bothers me in, uh, in, in general, <laughs> but uh, in specifics to, uh, to, to Kubernetes world, um, specifically that we need to rely on the sidecar and we still ha don't have a, like a life cycle for sidecars. So the Kafka will, will, will be relying on, like if we need to do graceful shutdown, uh, Kafka needs to send some of the information to the broker to saying, hey, I'm gracefully shutting down uh, because because of what not what is happening there. Um, and uh, in order to do that, I need to do some some sort of hacks like uh, like a pre shutdown hooks and writing some shell scripts, which is kind of possible to do. And many of us already familiar with this, but it's kind of nice. It feels weird. Yeah. So hopefully uh, this will be resolved at, 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 at some point where we'll have a, like a sidecar um, a sidecar life cycle. Uh, we didn't touch uh, much of the aspect of the looking a little bit deeper inside the traffic, for example, Envoy has um, a filter that is uh, available to look deeper inside the Kafka traffic. So we can, for example, collect information about the clients without, you know, clients uh, reporting to, uh, to, to this. Another benefit that we can have with the service mesh and with the Envoy filter is maybe kind of like a, a, a upgrading the protocol. So we can, um, um, sometimes it also might cause some of the, some of the issues where you're running uh, different protocols for your application, for your client and for your, uh, for your Kafka broker. So Kafka broker needs to do some extra stuff in order to either do um, upgrade of the protocol. So those type of things also important. And, and more importantly, why I like personally the operator approach in, in this case, um, 
the operator approach can uh, can programmatically work with some of the things uh, around Kafka. For example, you don't want to restart your Kafka cluster want to. if, um, for example, your um, something happened with your controller. Like you don't want to st restart your controller like arbitrary. You want to restart your controller the last. In this case, you will not uh, waste the time on the automation. But anyway, so I would like to you know uh, invite you to check this out. Some of the resources that we prepared after the, uh, this presentation. It's kind of like our uh, um, what is it called? You just pick one. You yeah. know, we didn't put any labels, so you got to go to all the resources. It'll be great. Yeah, so we love. QR so codes. Um, yes, with this, um, this is Danica Fine from Confluent. I'm Victor Gamma from Kong, and as always, have a nice day. <laughs>